Lindsay, I'd love to borrow your watch just here if it's possible. Sure. <sighs> Hello, everyone. This is my second time at Greenbelt. I was here last year with a very different story um, with uh, my friend, friends Robin and Naomi, who's here in Three Acres and a Cow, which is a history of English land rights and protest in folk song and story. And somehow, I was able to look at you without any notes for about two hours recounting a thousand years of English land rights and protest because there's something extremely easy about telling a story that's not one that's right inside um, yourself. And this is the first time someone's actually asked me to start talking because I was only ordained by the Kohenet Institute last year to start talking of my journey. And so even though I am, for a lot of the time, a professional storyteller, I have notes. <laughs> so just to explain first, um, so the co I'd pretty much have to do this speech if I was speaking to a group of Jewish people in the UK. So I'm the first person uh, in Britain that's um, gone on this particular course. And whilst, of course, there are many knowledgeable Jews who know lots about the different parts of their history in the mainstream, if someone asked me in the Jewish community to come and do a talk, I think I would pretty much start in the same way that I'm starting with you. So the Kohenet Hebrew Priestess Institute facilitates the creation of transformative Jewish ritual that is embodied, earth-based, feminist, and inspired by traditions of women's spiritual leadership. It draws both on ancient sources and on contemporary creativity. And it responds both to the horror and the hope in the world around us, giving room for expression and direct action. Um, f for me, the, the women and um, the people that have come to Kohenet don't fit into a single denomination category. Um, and, and even the binary of belief and not belief isn't quite relevant. There are some people who will see God in just the same way that you do and other people who have a concept through physics that gives them wonder in the universe and all are equally welcome. So I thought I would tell you my story by just giving you um, a patchwork of memories. And maybe now and then you can guess what age I was, but it's roughly in order. Um, and maybe one day it will turn into a great and linear speech. <clears throat> I remember when I was little, my dad telling me about his grandfather and his grandmother, all the Yiddish songs they used to sing, and how his grandmother when he had a sickness or a cold, would say Hebrew prayers over him whilst dripping wax from Shabbat candles into a bowl of water and wisping it over his head just in case to keep away the evil eye. And red thread as well was something that you combined your holy prayers with, but you added the thread just in case, even though that wasn't in the book. And I remember having my own rituals when I was little that I created for myself. I remember learning a couple of prayers, finding an old book and deciding for myself to say nighttime and morning prayers, but with a, a very specific outcome in mind and creating bubbles of light around myself to keep away the monsters under the bed. I remember envisioning God as a cartoonist called Hofnung. He drew what a hum looked like, and the hum was a big, wide, beatific, grinned creature. I'm sitting in Sunday school, and God is the Lord with a clear set of rules to live by. And if you continually hearken to these words, all will be well, and rain will fall in its proper seasons. And so we learn the seasons, and we learn how the months go, different from the ones we learn in daily school. Just like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, and David, and Solomon, and Saul before us. I learn how to do things properly, because that is what God likes. It's Passover. My bubba and my grandma light the, Shabbat, like, light the candles for Passover. But they're doing it at the wrong time, and I know that God gets very angry about this, so I blow the candles out, and I'm then hideously terrified by how all the adults are hideously terrified by me and my insolence. <clears throat> it is Shabbat. And I tell my friends in synagogue that this morning I was listening to the radio and they gasp. You were listening to the radio on Shabbat. 
Who have they learned this judgment from? I'm about 12. Me and my best friend in school, Carol, we're comparing what we've learned in Christian and Jewish Sunday school. And she tells me about Jesus. And I say, ah, oh, yes, well, I've worked out. Um, Jews are still waiting for the Messiah to come. That's what, that's what we believe. And he will come and he will save the world. And every woman hopes that she will give birth to the Messiah. I hope I will give birth to the Messiah. My friend Carol looks at me and says, Rachel, I think you might be the Messiah. I didn't really believe her, don't worry. <laughs> my bubba, my grandma, um, prepares the fish fingers for tea for me and my Zayda, my grandpa, who I'm staying with. And she takes a couple of memorial candles uh, out of a cupboard next to the tuna fish and the sweet corn. She looks at the calendar, checks how many she needs to light, and she lights them between the post and the little stamps of what you need to do next tomorrow. And no words are said but they're always there. I'm living in Camden with my friend Leslie, and I'm marveling at how crumpled I feel by London. How I feel that people don't seem to worry, don't seem to feel like they matter, and either that causes them to mistreat others or mistreat themselves, and I wonder how it's possible. And maybe it's because they feel that it doesn't matter what they do because it has no effect in a city of millions. I'm at a folk festival that I went to every year with my family where people from around the world would share their folk traditions. I'm lying on the grass in peace and I ask myself, am I romanticizing the countryside? Because if Camden is so stressful, why am I not here so often? Is it the kind of thing that people just reserve for holidays? I feel that this interest is far, far from my ancestors who dwelt so long in cities and ghettos. And as a storyteller and a folk singer, I feel like I have nothing in common with the husbands and rabbis that were my great grandparents. I am 24. I watch a woman leading prayers for maybe one of the first times in my life and she's about the same age as me and she wears things in the synagogue that I've only seen men wear before. I look down at the page that she's reading from in the prayer book, and the poetry is Lord, God, Master, King, Father, and I am nowhere to be seen. I look at her. What is she getting that I'm not? How can she believe this stuff? How? And then I realize that I am the only one feeling frustrated in this conversation with the book. The book is pretty happy as it is. And if I continue having this argument with it, I will just get frustrated and the book will still be happy. And that will be that, that will be the end of the day. So I decide for the first time, how do I want to spend this day of reflection? And I stop chopping at the surface of the pool of words. And I ask myself, Rachel, what words would you need to replace these prayers with for them to make sense to you? What are your words for God? What are your ways of phrasing things? I feel myself inside the prayers. I'm seeking community. I don't want to live with the bitterness some of my friends have from the communities they're not satisfied with. And I love my ancestors, but I can't find the resonance with the institutional communities. I want to do what I've learned in permaculture, to be on the riverbank. I don't want a community in the middle of nowhere in a green field. I want to be in that place where most life is. I am in that community house which happened to be a Jewish one. I don't know how I got there because I'd been away for so long. And my friend Daniel every night says we should read the Book of Days. He opens his favorite rabbi's book and inside it there is a calendar. But it's not the straight down one that I learned in Sunday school. It is a wheel. And the wheel of the year where the festivals speak to each other across the seasons. And how did I spend so many years in Sunday school and not see a calendar filled with love of the earth and an indigenous people who'd left their land but kept their stories? At this point, when non-Jewish people ask me, what is Judaism? 
I try and find the way to tell them about a place called Yavna, where an indigenous land-based people had to take their traditions and a group of rabbis decided how it would be that we could make those portable. And this is the magical thing I say because so many people who have to leave a land for whatever reason never have time to make their culture portable. And that's as far as I take the story. In the community house, it takes five years to unpin the narratives. Let them stand for other people who find them meaningful. I find where I am in this. In this house, we decide non-judgment, no matter everyone's welcome. And yet everyone who comes in says to us, I'm not a proper Jew. I'm not a religious person. I'm not really proper. I'm not every single person who comes in has a vision of someone else in the center of the circle. So we make Transgender Day of Remembrance with our Jewish prayers. And we find Muslim Jewish evenings where our words can intertwine with each other. I'm in a synagogue in Brussels. And the cantor is saying the same prayers that I've heard for my whole childhood, teenhood, adulthood. But for the first time, I hear someone reaching for something beyond that is intangible. And I realize that what I do as a storyteller is not that far from my ancestors at all, my cousins. This man, he is not performing on a stage. He is conducting souls. He is listening to the people around him, though they're often silent, and reaching up for something else and listening to that too, drawing it back down into his belly and speaking out. I'm in New York. And I've booked a couple of weeks. I'm at a retreat that's for Jewish artists. And I'm like, ah, after I go to the retreat for Jewish artists, I'm going to go to, um, to the middle of the city. And I don't know, go to some bars. I'm just a bit tired of London. There'll be something exciting there. But I've got in my bag a picture that I made for the teacher who drew the circle of the year. And in her book, it was just a little black and white graphic. But I've made a painting of it that's been sitting in my community house for five years of this wheel that goes round with the seasons. And I call her and I say, you don't know me, but I've got this picture for you, a version of your picture. Can I give it to you? She says, well, actually, next week we've got um, the convening of our cohort for Cohenet for the Institute. Would you like to come? I seem to have booked the right amount of travel time, and so I go. And when I get there, we study. And we study at first in the way that I'm used to, and then they say, well, now we're going to do some dancing with a prayer shawl. And the bit of me that has grown up with straight lines and linear learning says, dancing with a prayer shawl, how is that learning? But when someone starts drumming and I put it over my head, the smell of the tallit reminds me of my childhood when I was allowed in the synagogue I went to into the men's section. Reminds me of being wrapped up in a scent that I've been away from for a long time, the scent of that fabric. And as I dance, I'm in touch with my Muslim sisters and the way that they have a portable space for their sacredness. Wherever they go, they can cover their heads and feel like they're in somewhere alone and also together with others. And I start remembering there are wisdoms that are not written words. So when people ask me now, what is Judaism? I tell them a slightly different story. Sure, I tell them about how there was this indigenous land-based people and how they moved from that land and how there was this place called Yavna and people convened to decide what the story should be and how you could make an indigenous community portable, indigenous traditions portable, but I ask them and I say to them, who was in the room? And who wasn't in the room? Because in all of our cultures, there were the people that held the written language and the people who did not. And the women in my culture were not in the room. So I'm here to affirm this journey, which some of you may be on in your own traditions to find the divine in yourself and yourself in the divine precisely as you are. They were not a myth and they are not a new age fabrication. And whilst our restoration is a patchwork quilt which cannot quite cover what is lost, Know that your mothers really were diviners, holy weavers, prophetesses, ritual mourners, shamans and spirit drummers, story keepers, shrine makers, 
ecstatic dancers, judges, truth speakers, herbalists, doctors, fools, clowns, advisors, midwives, lovers who saw skin and opening as sensuality as prayer or seclusion with the one as their offering. And know that some stories have been buried whilst others are hiding in plain sight for us to pick up whenever we choose. They are as much in the simple act of my grandma keeping a calendar for her memorial candles as in the epic biblical myths and mysteries. The wheel of our year is a medicine wheel with the seasons rising, falling and spiraling and not every prayer belongs in a four walled room. And some of your ancestors and mine knew this. Know that there are stories of women in our books who stopped armies with a single hand. Women who pricked the consciences of kings with their radical activism and awakening. Know that in our own books, people sought out wisdom from dreams, trees, fields, the dead. That in our own grain bins, we once placed fat, full-breasted goddesses to symbolize a fertile harvest, and their symbols and names still sit amongst us in our names for the one. And we are all in the image of the one. It's double helix spinning through us, atoms trembling in everything. And we are all made of the stories we feed on. And we can choose the stories to eat and which to leave and which to share with others so that they can see the divine in themselves and themselves in the divine. And I choose these delicious ones. <laughs>